All right, we might get started. I know there's going to be quite a number of people continuing to join us um, over the next couple of minutes as, as people sign into the actual webinar. Um, welcome to our special use airspace webinar for 2024. So first of all, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement to country. Um, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians and um, knowledge holders of the lands we meet today and their continuing connection to the land, water and community. I pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are in attendance to this webinar today. So as I said, welcome to our controlled airspace webinar. This is the first one that we have for 2024. My name's Kirsty. I'm the Industry Engagement Manager here at CASA. So as per our previous webinars, for those of you that have joined us before, this one is a recorded um, webinar session. And the reason we do that is that we make it available on our CASA website under the Pilot Safety Hub for controlled airspace um, and also on our CASA YouTube channel. So that can be referred back to at any stage later on down the track. Now your cameras and microphones have been disabled at this point, um, just for the courtesy of other people participating in the webinar. But if you'd like to ask any questions, you do have the ability to use the chat function here in Microsoft Teams. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Microsoft Teams, you'll see a little chat bubble either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on how you've got that configured. Um, and you can actually click on that little chat bubble and then type in the questions that you have that you might like answered. Now, we do have a fair bit of content that we're going to try and get through today. Um, so we are going to try and put some side, some time at the end of the actual webinar to try and get to some of those questions. But if we aren't able to get to every question that we get to or, or, or some of them, then don't, don't panic that we will try and get back to you via email after the actual webinar session. So with such an interesting topic, who better to speak on um, this special use airspace than those who are actually responsible for declaring airspace in Australia and also one of our many special use airspace users. So joining me today I have Erica Davies from the Office of Airspace Regulation who you might be able to see up on the camera on your screen and also Flight Lieutenant Max Murphy from our Joint Airspace Control Cell with Defence. So welcome to you both and thank you for joining us today um, and also for the knowledge that you're bringing to this particular webinar. Now, you may not be able to actually see Max on the camera like you can see Erica up on the screen. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't have a camera available to him at the moment. It's always so nice to see our presenters, but unfortunately, we just don't have that ability for Max today. Now, before we get started, I just want to talk through um, our digital badges that we do have available for our webinar series. Some of you who have been involved with these before may have actually seen these before. We have signed up with a Credly in order to um, provide an opportunity for you to recognise that you've been a part of some of these webinars and let people know that you, you have this understanding and, and this education from the special use airspace and maybe even some of our previous webinars. So for those of you that stay on for the duration of the webinar, you'll receive an email from Cred Credly at the end and that you'll be able to claim that badge. And you might like to use that on your social media, on your, um, uh, your LinkedIn pages or anything along those lines. All right, so to get us started on our special use airspace, I'm gonna hand over to Erica from the Office of Airspace Regulation. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Kirsty said, I'm here from the Office of Airspace Regulation, the OAR, and one of our key functions is to declare SUA areas. So obviously we need to start with the basics. What are they? Uh, hopefully you're all familiar with PRD areas. So that's prohibited, restricted and danger areas. And what you may not be aware of is that on the 30th of November last year, these areas were renamed SUA areas, so special use airspace areas. But there's nothing to worry about here or be concerned about. It's effectively just a change in acronym. So when we're talking about SUA areas, we're still talking about prohibited, restricted and danger areas. So as hopefully you know, there aren't any prohibited areas anymore in Australia. So today we're just gonna be talking about restricted areas and danger areas. 
Now, restricted areas are established in the vast majority of cases in the interests of safety, your safety usually. For example, when an organisation is going to try to launch a high power rocket, um, as you may have seen a fair bit about in the news recently with what's going up, uh, gone, going on up at Bowen in Queensland, um, the level of airspace risk that's associated with those kinds of activities usually warrants the declaration of a restricted area to keep aircraft clear. But there are a couple of other reasons that we might declare a restricted area. Uh, one example being the recent ASEAN summit that was held in Melbourne. So restrictions there were necessary in the interests of national security rather than in the interests of public safety. But nine times out of 10, an RA is there because someone is doing something that presents a significant safety risk to you or your aircraft. The areas are only declared inside Australian territory. So I'll come back to what that means. Um, but the key thing here is that you cannot fly through a restricted area unless you have permission to do so. Now, the next section you can see on the slide, we have danger areas. Now, these are declared where activities that are dangerous to the flight of aircraft may exist. Now, this could be a gliding competition where you have a high density of gliders in the airspace, some kind of drone operation, or perhaps a flight training area, such as the one out to the west of Bankstown. Now, these areas are typically more advisory in nature as the pilot in command. You may still choose to fly through that airspace, but the intent, our intent when we're declaring these areas, is that you can make that choice with a clear understanding of any potential hazard in the airspace. Now, as of the 30th of November last year, a new type of danger area was created, uh, namely military operating areas or MOAs. Now, these behave more like restricted areas in a lot of ways, but I'm going to defer a detailed discussion of them to Max. Now, danger areas can be declared anywhere in Australian administered airspace. So that means anywhere in the, either the Brisbane or the Melbourne FIR. And as I've already mentioned, access permission for these is not required. They are more advisory. Now, before I move on, or rather hand over, uh, I'll just quickly explain the distinction between Australian territory and Australian administered airspace. So I've used both those phrases in this discussion. There's an excerpt on the slide which shows part of the um, Newcastle VNC. And there's a little squiggly red line which shows the 12 nautical mile limit off the coast. Now that line is the limit of Australian territorial airspace. Anything past the line is administered by us on behalf of ICAO, but it isn't part of our territory. So if you're inside the line, we can declare restricted areas, but once you get outside the line, the OAR is only able to declare danger areas. Now that includes MOAs, military operating areas. To talk a little bit more about military uses of airspace, I'll hand over at this point to Max, who is going to give you a bit of an overview. Thank you very much, Erica. So good afternoon all. I am uh, Pilot Lieutenant Max Murphy from the Joint Airspace Control Cell, which is a small team within the Air Force that assists with airspace design and management for the ADF. As many of you may know, uh, the ADF is the largest user of special use airspace in Australia. The military uses special use airspace for a variety of purposes to meet our objectives and across all three services, Navy, Army and Air Force. A few of these are listed here, such as air traffic control zones, military ranges, both onshore and offshore, ground and air training areas, test and evaluation areas, and safety exclusion zones, um, potentially around uh, radiation hazards. Most of this airspace, as mentioned, uh, is declared for reasons of public safety, where we use restricted areas to safely segregate civil aircraft from hazardous military activities and their effects. However, the airspace can also be declared for national security purposes or for the protection of the environment. While the impost of military areas on civil activities can be significant, that is often the only way that the ADF can safely achieve uh, outcomes. So defence airspace was designed and imp implemented over multiple decades and is constantly undergoing changes uh, as with all special use airspace in Australia. Wherever possible though, we will aim to conduct our activities in our permanent airspace. Uh, where this is not achievable, Jack supports the that Jack, sorry, the Joint Airspace Control Cell supports the ADF with design and implementation of temporary airspace in accordance with the flexible use of airspace principles that you see here. Some of these considerations are the flexible volumes of, of airspace, uh, limited activation areas, uh, sorry, timings uh, located away from local populace, and fair and reasonable access where practicable. 
uh, we want to enable our activities with as little restriction to your activities as possible. And, and the uh, following considerations form part of the design process. Uh, so the determination of the least restrictive measures, as mentioned, uh, a danger area may be more suitable than a restricted area, remaining away from major civil air routes and minimal uh, lateral dimensions, uh, so and vertical dimensions uh, required to safely achieve the outcomes. As part of this process, uh, an agency is assigned to an airspace according to the area's needs. For a danger area, this is a contact. For a restricted area, this is a controlling authority. And for a new military operating area, this is an administering authority. So what is a controlling authority? Uh, at its core, a controlling authority is responsible for three main functions. The first is no TEM management, ensuring that the airspace is appropriately activated and deactivated according to usage and requirements. The second is access control, which includes being in a position to judge whether non-participant clearances are safe to approve. If it is unsafe to do so, access requests must be denied. Uh, the third is remaining contactable by the published method during all periods of activation. Controlling authority details may include phone numbers, discrete frequencies, or the use of a promulgated uh, CTAF frequency as advised by NOTAM, AIPSUP, or ERSA, and more on that later. Uh, before I run through the service, oh, sorry, just on that slide there, and uh, alternate controlling authority uh, may also be appointed over certain periods of time. This is something that will be uh, mentioned in the in the NOTEMs that we will discuss. But uh, the standard practice is the controlling authority within URSA that's listed there will be the um, airspace controlling authority. So before I run through uh, the service uh, services received within the different types of special use airspace, I will out outline some of the details on the new military construct of a military operating area. So MOA are generally established to encompass military activities, including live firing. For non-participating aircraft, flight within active MOA, so that's military operating area, is generally only approved in exceptional circumstances. MOA have the same entry approval requirements as restricted areas for all aircraft within Australian territory, uh, but only to Australian aircraft outside of Australian territory. And I imagine for this uh, audience here that uh, MOAs can be treated both inside and outside uh, that 12 mile line uh, as a restricted area in terms of uh, clearance requirements. With that understanding, there are two main factors uh, to what service is provided within the special use airspace. The type of special use airspace and the type of controlling authority. Uh, let's also talk a little bit about uh, conditional status, which you see on the slide here, RA1, RA2 and RA3. So when you look at, when you're looking at your map or URSA, you will see some of the restricted airspaces have a conditional status associated with them. This is important when conducting your flight planning. So if we look on the slide under RA1, pilots may flight plan through restricted area and under normal circumstances expect a clearance from ATC. Uh, so that's that's quite a, um, allowable and you can ex as a, exactly as it says there, expect a clearance through that airspace, whether it's active or not. So, uh, so, sorry, Max, I'll just interrupt for a second. Just confirm, so RA1, where are you most likely to see that? Is that around maybe um, one of the actual military aerodromes? Is that where you're more likely to see RA1? That's correct. So a, a, a good uh, example would be the uh, restricted area Romeo 155 Alpha around uh, RAF base Pierce in Western Australia. Now that's uh, only activated with a, a control service. And yes, it's very... Uh, allowable to get through that airspace. A clearance is expected and flight planning occurs through that airspace at, at all times. There are exceptional circumstances where a clearance may be denied, uh, but that, that's a good example of where that RA1 construct will take place. Moving now uh, to the RA2. So uh, it, it says actually a small, minor error on the uh, slide here that uh, pilots must not flight plan through the restricted area. Uh, a clearance from ATC is not assured. So that's to say you um, you are not to flight plan through the area, but depending on what traffic is uh, within that area at the time, you may be able to get a clearance. Uh, RA3 is the most restrictive, and that's pilots must not flight plan through the restricted area, and clearances will not be available. 
So moving to an example of this special use airspace uh, structure, I've taken a picture of the East Sail chart down in Victoria, and I've also added a fake Romeo 999, which you see is a red circle there for example purposes only. So for danger areas like danger, uh, sorry, Delta 353 near East Sail, which is that corridor that runs uh, northwest to northeast on that airspace, no service is provided. Only a contact is listed and the information they can offer will generally be limited to the type of activity and expected activation timings. Uh, for this area, the East Sail entry within Ursa contains information regarding its use. Uh, Delta 353 here is for civil transit of that airspace. For restricted areas, the service provision changes according to the controlling authority as mentioned. So ATC airspace, like Romeo 391 Alpha Bravo depicted, uh, will generally offer an air traffic control service, including the provision of separation. So airspace controlled by Air Services Australia, 452 Squadron or 453 Squadron uh, is ATC airspace. And the airspace depicted uh, here is controlled by 453 Squadron East Sail Flight. So we know that a control service would be provided. Sorry, Max, could I jump in here for of two course. seconds? Just a question. Um, if I was um, a pilot used to flying in Class G airspace, I'm not used to flying through controlled airspace and talking to controllers, but I've been cleared to transit one of these areas. Do you have any advice for how to manage that? Yeah, so I can definitely see how that uh, unfamiliarity may be um, slightly daunting. I would say that the uh, air traffic control uh, is there to set you up for success and ensure that things run smoothly in their airspace. So air traffic control will provide you with a clearance that separates you from other aircraft or traffic as required, um, depending on the, the type of uh, airspace. Uh, and it will always set you up with the information relevant to your transit. So um, personally, as a controller, I want to ensure that everybody's on the same page. So if you are unsure at any point uh, on how to proceed with the transit, uh, from my perspective, I would want the pilot uh, to not hesitate and contact the controller on frequency. You know, bottom line, uh, if you have any uncertainty at all um, or lack of familiarity, don't let it stop you from speaking up. Just uh, ask on frequency uh, on uh, any questions that you may have. Okay, sure, thanks very much. So we're getting quite a number of questions coming through the chat channel. I'm just going to let um, Max keep going just for the moment because it may answer a couple of these questions, but we will try and get back to some of your questions as we progress. Thanks, Kirsty. So to continue on, uh, non-ATC airspace, um, for a restricted area this is, uh, like the fictitious Romeo 999 you see here, um, is in the example used for military and non-flying activities. Uh, they will provide, the controlling authority will provide access approval or denial and remain contactable, but they will not uh, be able to provide a separation service and any segregation required to transit shall be coordinated between the respective pilots. So non-ATC agencies uh, may include range control officers, uh, the joint airspace control cell, base command posts, things of uh, that nature. The same ATC slash non-ATC rule of thumb uh, applies to mowers. So Mike 301 Alpha Bravo, which is within that large ring you see depicted, is controlled by 453 Squadron e Sail Flight, so a control service would be provided. Uh, lastly, I've also included an orange dashed line in the image, which roughly indicates that uh, 12 nautical mile territorial waters zone around Australia. In, uh, in reference to the previous slide. So Max, I might just cut in and just tackle a couple of these questions. We may not get to all of them right now, um, but Barry asked a question, when you say pilots must or may flight plan through RA1 or RA2, does that mean you have to flight plan, have a flight plan submitted in NAPES or may means you can request a clearance regardless of whether you have a plan in NAPES? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, Generally, a plan on the controller side can be created in the uh, in the systems that they operate. If, for example, uh, you planned 
uh, just internally, not as a flight plan, but you plan to transit uh, from one place to another and the opportunity becomes available to transit their airspace. You may have contacted the controller on frequency and they can give you a clearance. Uh, they may be able to then create a plan within their system that facilitates that. It, uh, having a flight plan within the system is not a requirement for transit of uh, military controlled airspace as a, a general rule. But in the, in the first instance, I would reach out to the controlling authority of the airspace just to, to confirm. Uh, and you can do that also while, you, while you're on the ground uh, to, to call up and, and ask a few of these questions for uh, airspace that is relevant to you and your area. And I'm gathering having a flight plan in the system obviously means that it reduces the workload of the controller that they may actually be able to facilitate that as well and that the controller actually knows what the person wants to do. Is that correct? Uh, that, that is um, largely correct, correct. What I would say though sometimes is uh, flight plan submissions made through the civil system may not reach the defence system. So yeah, again, I'd, I'd contact the controlling authority to, to see what uh, what their take would be. Thanks, Max. And just one more question before we move on. Um, a question from Joss Bonney. So a mower is like an RA, not a danger area as per the previous slides? Max, do you want me to take this one? Yeah, that would be great, Erica. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a little bit technical to do with the legislation, in fact, um, which is why I didn't really want to go drill down too deeply into it. But it's a very fair question considering the way um, they act in practice and the way that pilots are expected to interact with them. So because of the um, restrictions on us as, as a, an airspace authority in terms of declaring airspace to which restrictions apply, um, these offshore areas that exist currently, um, a lot of them have already transitioned, but there are still some that are yet to transition um, offshore military restricted areas. Technically, they're not compatible with um, with the requirements under ICAO to not restrain foreign registered aircraft. So for a foreign registered aircraft, there is actually no, um, no hard and fast um, rule that says a foreign registered aircraft cannot transit a mower. Um, but for an Australian aircraft, the legislation has been drafted in such a way that those conditions are applied. So we in Australia can um, constrain the behaviour of Australian aircraft and the legislation has been drafted to do that for mowers, but we cannot constrain the behaviour of foreign registered aircraft. So they look like a duck and they quack like a duck and they waddle like a duck, but as far as an Australian uh, aircraft is concerned, they're not really a duck, they're um, something else, they're a restricted area. So that may have been as clear as mud. I'm happy to discuss it more um, later on if that's appropriate. Thanks, Erica. We'll keep, Erica, we'll keep going just in the interest of time. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Erica. So uh, moving to uh, emergency access, can military special use airspace be accessed in an emergency? So the controlling authority or the administering authority, depending on the airspace in question, will afford priority access to all emergency aircraft if safe to do so. This may require the establishment of separation or the suspension of defence activities within that area, uh, which can take some time. Associated activity, um, sorry, associated activity aircraft may be instructed by the controlling authority to report on the ground and a check fire may be issued. And this is uh, essentially happening, happening in the background if an emergency clearance is uh, requested for access, so hence why there might be a delay. For further information on uh, access requirements, as particularly in an emergency, uh, please refer to AIP en route 5.1, uh, which details the general access procedures for special use airspace. So how can you find out about the activation of the uh, areas in question? So determining special use airspace um, activation is a multi-step process. The first step is viewing the special use airspace section of URSA, which contains a list of all airspace and how they're activated. And I'll we'll be showing that shortly with some screenshots. Second, you will want to view the NOTAMs relevant to you. And this can, can be done through the NAPES portal, again, which we will discuss shortly. Uh, AIP SUPS, uh, that's 
aeronautical information public in, uh, publication supplements uh, for military activities often include the set times when temporary and permanent special use airspace will be activated, or otherwise it may refer pilots to no TAM. Permanent areas can be found uh, listed entirely now uh, within URSA, the En Route Supplement Australia. Uh, and here we have an extract from the restricted area section. For each RA, we have an identifier, a conditional status, a vertical limit range, activation period, the no nominated controlling authority, and a brief description of the kind of activity underway within the RA. I would like to hand over back to Erica now, who's got a, a bit more uh, information and expertise in this uh, area. Thank you. That's very kind of you, Max. Um, all right. So as Max was saying, you've got some brief descriptions there. In addition to vertical limits, uh, a restricted area would also have lateral limits, of course. Um, you'll see these usually on the charts in the course of your flight planning. But if you have a need for more uh, specific information, you can go to another document, which is on the Air Services website, uh, the AIP section of the Air Services website. That's called the Designated Airspace Handbook. It's a bit of a read, um, the DAH. Uh, so it'd be rare that you need to go to look at that, but it is there if you want it. Um, before I move on to danger areas, I will just mention that, for example, we've got Romeo 129, uh, there, if you look under hour, that's activated by NOTAM. So if you want to know what the activation of that is, the activation status of that airspace is, you'll need to log on to NAPES um, in order to figure it out if you're planning to operate in the area. And I'm going to come back to NAPES in, in a few minutes. Um, if we could just flick to the next slide, please. So here we've got extracts from the danger area and the military operating area sections. And I will just mention there is currently a typo in the URSA as published. And as some of you may be familiar with, the update timeframes for aviation documentation are, are quite extensive. So I'm not sure how long it will take to get that fixed. But a military operating area has an administering authority, not a contact, even though it is a danger area. Yes, it's a little confusing. <laughs> So as for a restricted area, a danger area will have an identifier, it'll have a vertical limit range, activation period, and a brief description of the activity that's underway within the area. So I said before, flight training areas are danger areas. You could have blasting activities underway for mining operations, um, high velocity exhaust plumes, things like that. Um, and the key difference here is that we've got a contact point rather than a controlling authority for a danger area. So this again emphasizes the fact that you don't need permission to fly through an active danger area. But as the pilot in command, you need to consider the kind of activity that's underway inside that area and then decide whether or not you're comfortable with the associated risk level. And that's the decision for you to make. Um, for the military operating areas, it's a little bit different. Uh, as we were talking about before, these behave for an Australian aircraft as if they were an RA3 restricted area. And it might be worth mentioning um, at this point, there was a query about, you know, aren't RA3 restricted areas effectively prohibited areas? It, it, it looks and smells a bit like that, but at the end of the day, a prohibited area, you cannot go in there for any reason. So even if you've got an engine failure and you're trying to do a forced landing or some other emergency, you've got someone on board who's having a heart attack or there's some need, a uh, pressing need in relation to preservation of human life, say, uh, to transit that area. If it was a prohibited area, it wouldn't matter. You cannot cross the line. But a, an RA3 restricted area does afford a little bit more flexibility. And I think Max is maybe going to say something about that a little later on. Um, so. The last thing I'll say about military operating areas is that most of them are offshore. So most of the time you're not really going to need to think about it, but just bear in mind that there are some areas that particularly where you have a series um, of, of related airspace volumes like the um, the airspace volumes associated with the military base at Nowra. So if you're flying down the east coast, um, there are a couple of what were restricted areas and what either are now or will shortly be uh, military operating areas and they're going to behave for your purposes as if they were an RA3 restricted area so just bear that in mind. 
All right. Before um, I flick forward, um, yeah. uh, Erica, I'll probably just note very earlier on in the webinar, I did paste in a link to some AIP SUPs, one which might be relevant to what you were just talking about with regard to guidance material on the new military operating areas and the transitional arrangements. And it actually outlines in there in an annex about what the current um, military operating areas are, but also the new ones that are actually going to be coming into effect in, I think it's, is it June, Erica, that the next ones come into effect? Yeah, the next ones come into effect in June, and then we have a final set of transitions um, that are going to occur for the 28th of November. And at that point, that should be all extraterritorial restricted areas moved across to mowers. Okay, so that might be a handy one for people to, to go and Agreed. utilise that link to have a look at. Definitely. Okay, now, um, sorry, is it a good time to jump in? Go for it, Max. <clears throat> Excellent. So if, if we can cast our mind now back to the east sale example uh, of, of that airspace contract, I'll use that as, a, um, uh, as an illustration of the process that we might go through to find a few of those uh, details. So I have two screenshots here from the special use airspace section within the latest URSA. I've looked at my chart of uh, east sale, for example, and identified uh, what areas are on my flight path. Let's say Romeo 391 Alpha as an example. I then flip to the special use airspace section of URSA and see the information regarding that area. The vertical limits are set by NOTAM, so potentially surface to unlimited, with hours propagated by NOTAM. Uh, 453 Squadron East Sale are the authority, and it is for the military flying slash non-flying activities. I'll then have to refer to NOTAM for further information. To do so, I can look up the area specifically within NAPES, uh, which will be touched on in just the next slide. So I've identified that the airspace will be activated uh, within that um, activation period of time, uh, sorry, within my uh, intended transit. I may then want to go ahead and contact the controlling authority uh, to see what clearances may or may not be available for that period of time. So to do so, I look to the little uh, brackets to the left of Flight Commander 453 Squadron East Sail. See the number 21. This is the relevant contact reference number for the Flight Commander 453 Squadron East Sail, or rather the controlling authority. So we can then flip a few pages uh, later in URSA to the list of relevant contact numbers, as you see there, and find the applicable contact number within the chart, i.e. next to line 21. So this is particularly helpful for airspace that may not have a corresponding URSA aerodrome page. For East Sail, you'd have a, a lot of success as well, looking at the main URSA page for East Sail for contacts. One last bit of information, uh, many pilots use various electronic flight bag programs, which can be very useful in collating NOTEM information. However, temporary special use airspace uh, might not be accurately reflected, so it is important to check those flight information region groups for the latest timings. And I'll, I'll do some minor in injects on the next uh, slide to, to highlight where that becomes relevant. Okay, thanks Max. I'll, I'll take over from here, just jump in when you need to. Um, so prior to about 2022, although there's no hard and fast line, I don't think, um, no TAMs activating temporary special use areas, um, such as a TRA for rocket launching activity, or perhaps TRAs associated with an air display like um, Avalon Airshow, they were raised on the relevant FIR. So in the case of Avalon, that would be the YMMM no TAMs. But where it directly affected an aerodrome, you would also see the NOTAM on the aerodrome as well. You'd have that duplication. But since 2022, these special use airspace uh, area NOTAMs are only being raised on the FIR as an, uh, in an attempt to move away from duplication. We all know there are a lot of NOTAMs out there and there's uh, sometimes it's a bit overwhelming working, working through them all and very time consuming. So there's a move to reduce duplication to try and cut down on the number of NOTAMs that are out there. But from a practical point of view, what it means is that if you're looking at the aerodrome, you're going to see the air display NOTAM, but you're not going to see the NOTAM that actually declares and activates any temporary use air, uh, temporary special use airspace that's associated with the air show. Um, 
and that's particularly relevant if you're only doing a location briefing. So if you're doing a flight plan and you've identified the various aerodromes that are along your flight path and you're doing a briefing in NAPES and you're just doing a location briefing using those uh, Y codes for the aerodromes, you will never see a temporary special use airspace uh, no TAM doing it that way. What you need to do is run um, an area briefing. So this is particularly important because, as I said on the first slide that I was speaking to, nine times out of 10, when we are declaring these temporary areas, we're doing it because there is an event, an activity taking place that presents some kind of risk to you. There's a safety risk uh, involved in this activity, and it's important that you know about it so that you can make an informed decision as pilot in command about whether or not either for a danger area you're going to choose to fly through it while the activity is underway with an understanding of the kind of activity or in the case of an RA, a TRA, you can't avoid it if you don't know that it's there and it's particularly to, important to avoid a temporary restricted area because we put restricted airspace in, in place when the risk is high enough to safety that it warrants total segregation. So by not knowing about these areas, your, your personal safety is, and, and the safety of anyone else in the aircraft is, is at risk. So in order to find these NOTAMs, what you need to do is make sure that you're doing an area briefing rather than just relying on location briefings. So at the risk of telling you all how to suck eggs, I mean, this may be what you're already doing, and if so, double thumbs up. But just in case, I'd like to go through a quick example here. Um, with an area briefing to uh, find special use airspace NOTAMs. So if you were flight planning from, say, Caboolture to Roma, we've got a picture here. I've just taken it from the Air Services webpage, uh, the NAPES webpage, if you were doing a briefing. And I've clicked on areas 40 and 41, which has brought up um, briefing areas 9410 and 9400. Um, uh, and I've deselected the meteorological information because it's not relevant for this particular example. Um, and then I've set the briefing period to three, three, six hours. So that corresponds to two weeks. That's the maximum briefing period that you can request in NAPES and it will capture absolutely everything that is currently out and published. Of course, if you're going to be flying tomorrow, that's entirely <laughs> excess to requirement, but just a little FYI. All right, so if we hit submit, um, then the uh, NAPE system should bring up on the next screen uh, the results of that area briefing. It'll look something like what's there. And rather than having to tediously scroll through all of the NOTAMs that, that are associated with all of the aerodromes that sit within those uh, areas, if you're just interested in um, getting the temporary restricted area NOTAMs and temporary danger area NOTAMs out of that briefing, might I suggest you just do control F, uh, keyboard shortcut, control F, type tempo, T-E-M-P-O, which is the authorised short form for temporary in a NOTAM. And then you can just click through, just arrow up and down through the active NOTAMs, and that will show you what's currently um, live uh, in the system. So these two that are here are associated with some regular rocket launching activities that are um, undertaken at a location called Funny Farm in Queensland. Probably not relevant to everybody in this chat, but you will not see these NOTAMs if you're only doing location briefings or only relying on NOTAMs that are associated with an aerodrome. And as I said, it's very important from a safety point of view that you know these things have been declared and are active because when they're active, there are high power rockets being launched through these areas. All right. So um, for permanent areas, so this, this is all the discussion of temporary restricted areas and temporary danger areas. For permanent areas um, such as, I don't know, the Romeo 654 series for the current example, if you're going from Caboolture to Roma, you can likewise just press control F and enter the identifier of the restricted area. So enter Romeo 654, enter, and it will flick down to the relevant NOTAM and you can find it nice and quickly and see whether or not it's active when you're planning to flight plan. So there are of course other ways of finding activation status of permanent restricted areas in NAPES. Um, if you've got any questions about that, then you can always ask them at the end. Um, Max, Kirsty. 
Yeah, if Max? I can just yep. uh, jump briefly in, this is a, a great time to talk about that uh, e-sale example. Now, if I can move two slides uh, back very quickly, and you'll notice, uh, sorry, one, one more, thank you. You'll notice uh, the ESX in brackets next to Romeo 391 Alpha. So what that refers to is an airspace group, uh, which is a collection of airspace uh, within the system that are associated with each other, and here ESX refers to East Sail Airspace. If you want to broadly brief East Sail Airspace for activation, we can move, sorry, next slide, please. We can insert in one of those briefing areas ESX, and it will come up with all of the East Sail Airspace within that group, which is uh, very he helpful when, when you have a particular airspace that you'd like to assess uh, all in one. I'd also like to take the opportunity to respond to uh, Mike's um, query in the chat uh, and, and further uh, give some information on the conditional status of RA2. Uh, I should have added that pilots must not flight plan through the restricted area unless on a route specified in URSA um, uh, Gen FPR or under agreement with the controlling authority. So for the example that you use there, uh, where you're flying uh, IFR and have a plan within NAPES, that would be most likely under uh, that exception that is uh, in accordance with a specified route. Thanks, Max. And it looked like there was a bit of backwards and forwards between Mike and a couple of other members about the flight planning through some of that um, restricted airspace. I'm very much aware we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, before we wrap up, while we've been talking about temporary restricted airspace and all of those sorts of things, um, something that does come up quite frequently is something called trigger notems. Um, could one of you quickly talk to that, maybe Erica at all? So when an AIP SUP is published for um, an activity and a okay, circumstance where you might publish an AIP SUP, where you've got something complicated, a complicated process, or maybe you want to provide an illustration, a NOTAM obviously is just a text block. It doesn't give you a picture. It doesn't, and a picture says a thousand words, much easier to interpret than a long list of lateral coordinates. Um, so from from time to time, you might want to put an ARP SUP together. Um, I've recently put one together for the rocket launching that I mentioned. Um, most of the military exercises that are undertaken have an AIP SUP associated with them, which speaks to how pilots might be able to request access to airspace, what any published diversion routes are, things like that. So when there's an AIP SUP that's promulgated for um, whatever reason, the the um, active period of the AIP SUP, for that period, there'll be a trigger NOTAM in the relevant um, area that directs pilots to that AIP SUP, lets them know it's been published and that they should look there for further information. Right, so it's like a guiding light to send them to find out a lot more information than what can be published in a NOTAM. Exactly. We try and keep NOTAMs reasonably short and sweet. As I said before, there's too many of them. And when they're very long and complicated, uh, they're less helpful. So a lot of the time it's useful where you've got extra information to package it all up into an AIP sub. Fabulous. And Drew's even written that, like AIP sub for major sporting events like the World Gliding Championships, for example. Fabulous. All right, look, I know we have run out of time and I know there have actually been a couple of more questions in the chat that we haven't necessarily gotten to. So as I said at the beginning of the, the webinar, we'll try and get back to you with some of those responses that we haven't been able to, to talk to here. But I just wanted to, to maybe highlight the, a couple of resources that we have potentially referred to within the, the webinar here, but also where you can find out some more information. So I know someone did have in the chat earlier about who can actually apply for a danger area and those sorts of things. Now, that's something that you can actually look up on the CASA webpage with regard to the Office of Airspace Regulation about um, requesting airspace or changes to procedures and those sorts of things. But a mechanism for which that happens is through um, the Aviation State Engagement Forum. So it's almost like an online consultation um, hub, I suppose, of which people that are planning or proposing new airspace, whether it be 
defence, um, it could be some of the, the rocket operators or even the gliding championships that came up before. If they're proposing airspace or, or procedure changes, then this is the mechanism of which they're sort of notifying people of what they would like to do. And that you can also respond to those um, proposals about whether th they have concerns or looking at different risks or even just to get some information about what might be coming up. It's also a forum that Air Services and the Bureau of Met uses to also notify people about maybe some of the changes that they have coming up with regard to maybe um, weather radars that might not be working that Bureau of Met might be letting people know about. So if you'd like to, to know a little bit more about the Aviation Safety Engagement Forum, you can have a look at that um, link and I'll put it into the chat shortly. And you can also subscribe to it. So you can subscribe by your state that you might operate in the most so that you'll actually get email notifications when things are coming up off there. Uh, reference some of the stuff that uh, Max has talked to today for um, major defence activities that might have special use airspace. You can have a look at the defence exercises pages. And also, if you want to ask any general questions, um, reference the Office of Airspace Regulation with some of the airspaces that they have um, declared, then you can also go through to that email address that we have up there on the screen. We've obviously talked to a, a lot of different AIP documentation today. So general AIP, URSA, charts, designated airspace handbook and those sorts of things. And we've also talked about AIP SUP and, and NOTAMs um, that are looked after by Air Services Australia. So just to summarise, we've looked at special use airspace and that terminology that replaces what we used to refer to as PRD, but in effect, it's really the same thing. So we've also talked about controlling authorities and administering authorities. So that restricted airspace versus the, the danger area um, kind of thing. We've also talked about conditional status and a couple of you have even had questions about how you access um, those airspaces reference the conditional status. Uh, we've also talked about um, the new military operating areas and giving you some links to where you can find out some more information about those. And we've also talked about how you can find out information for your flight planning through the different mechanisms like NOTAMs, AIP SUP and URSA and the like. Look, I know that this has been a lot of information to digest, but I think it is a really important one um, to get that information out there about how we utilise special use airspace and what we need to know from a pilot perspective. So I'd like to thank Erica and Max for their time today and, and all of that wonderful information that they've provided us in this particular session. And just to, a reminder to you, for those that you have stayed on the line, obviously you will be receiving an email shortly from Credly if you'd like to access um, your badge that you might be able to use for your social media profiling or LinkedIn. Um, otherwise, there is a lot more information that you can access, not in only in regard to controlled airspace, but a lot of other things like flight planning, uh, flying in different types of weather, all on our Pilot Safety Hub, which you can see the link for there. But otherwise, I'd like to thank everybody um, for joining us this afternoon on such a, a great topic to, to chat about that maybe doesn't get a lot of airtime normally. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>